full-size monoprimes at uh, six or eight meters diameter. And then extracted from these finite element analyses, essentially the, the reactions that we get from the soil uh, in a simplified way. So the, one of the beauties of, of detailed finite element analysis is you can then inquire if you like, everything that's happening about the mechanics of the system that you're studying. And we extracted the, the forces that the soil is applying to the pipe. And we then uh, fitted the, the behavior of the, those forces with some, some simple fitting curves, I'll, I'll go into this in a little more detail in, in a minute, so that what we could devise is a simplified model that reproduced the three-dimensional finite element analyses as close as possible. Why do we do that? Why don't we just use three-dimensional finite element analysis? The problem is that each of these analyses takes many hours of computing time. And if you're designing an entire wind farm, you want to explore many different designs at many different sites. You have to do literally thousands of computations. You need to have something so very fast. So the simple one-dimensional model that we have, which just uses these applied loads extracted from the finite element analysis, it runs in less than a second. So you can do thousands of those analyses. And as long as you're satisfied that they're reasonably close to the result that you would get from the finite element, the finite element analysis, then that's useful, as long as you're confident that the finite element analysis <coughs> itself represents the, the uh, results that you would get if you had a, a real test. So that was the, the philosophy. It was quite a long project. You can see there's a, a, an extended period of field testing. Um, planning at this stage, a uh, very important part of the philosophy that we didn't just do lots of tests and then see how we could pick the results afterwards. We actually were developing the new design methodology at the same time as we were planning the, the field testing. So the two had to go uh, hand in hand. Of course, things look fairly simple that way. The reality ends up being a lot more complicated um, but uh, out there in the real world, nothing ever goes quite to plan. Uh, let me just highlight one or two things. Um, essentially, this one here, uh, one of the sites we were using for the field testing was uh, previously used as a bombing range by the Air Force, and an unexploded bomb was found on the site. Um, a major part of the equipment was in the industrial yard used by the company ESG that designed and built the equipment. Uh, we had about half a million dollars worth of equipment sitting in their yard. Unfortunately, their immediate neighbors uh, had a chemical storage facility which caught fire and essentially that, that it was a major industrial accident. Uh, and the equipment which we just uh, designed and had constructed was fried due to the, the, the fire that was like next door. So, I mean, you just can't anticipate this sort of thing when, when designing a research program. But out there in the we real world, it's a sort of thing that happened. In spite of all that, we still managed to, to deliver the final report on time. And uh, this is, is rather unusual, but actually, as a result of sort of all that planning, um, the, this research project actually won last year the uh, British Geotechnical Association Planning Award. Now, research projects quite often win awards. There are lots of awards for research. And so you know, um, it's quite often possible to pick up research awards. The unusual thing here is that this is a project for, for a, 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 an award for a, a geotechnical project, not for a research project. So this was competing against major construction projects involving geotechnical engineering in, in the UK. In fact, it's the first time that the, the funding award was won by uh, a research project. So what did we, we do? A little bit more de detail. It, we tested at two sites, 
Um, one of them in the north of England. So this is a site uh, where it, the, the material is a glacial clay. Um, it's very like the material that you get in the North Sea um, in the immediately adjacent area, which is one of the main areas where the, the, the turbines are being sited. The other sorts of material that you get quite a lot in the North Sea are um, sands. Some sites are clay sites, some sites are the sand sites. And we couldn't actually locate a, a suitable onshore site for the testing in the UK, so we actually went to a site in, in northern France at Dunkirk uh, to do the, the testing there. And one of the reasons that we chose these two particular sites is that they had been used before for research projects on um, pilot foundations. So there was already quite a good database of site investigation data at those two sites. Uh, we supplemented that with a lot more data from our program. We, we did um, uh, cone penetration tests, uh, a lot of laboratory testing. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through the detail there, but we have essentially a very good information on the, the, the profile of each of the sites, so we knew very accurately what the soil conditions were at those two sites. Quite complex soil conditions, particularly at the, the, the Caribbean site, uh, which involved the, the, the clay. The next stage was that the, the Imperial College part of the team carried out very accurate finite element analyses of uh, piles at those two sites. So three-dimensional finite element analysis, very carefully trying to model the change of stiffness of the soil from the high stiffness that you get at small strains, reducing to much lower stiffness at larger strains. And the reason for that is that later on, when we were predicting the behavior of the pile, we wanted to be able to capture both this initial stiffness under relatively small loads, but also the, the ultimate failure of, of the pile as well. And for a fairly short pile, you get a, a simple mechanism. Here's a, 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 the analysis of a short pile that it behaves almost rigidly rotating about some point, about two thirds of the way down the pile. If you have a longer pile, then it, it doesn't behave completely <coughs> as a rigid body, but uh, the pile actually bends, and you, you get uh, significant displacements near the surface, with much smaller displacements further down the pile. An important part of the project was, first of all, carrying out these finite element analyses. And with the finite element analysis, we predicted all the results from the, the test program. So an important part of it was that these were genuine predictions before the, the testing started uh, on site. So what the, the testing involved, a, a typical test setup involved testing a, a pile, so here's a one pile in the ground with an extension piece on the top so that we could apply a horizontal load at a height above the top of the pile, representing the sorts of loads that you get on a wind turbine. You need a large reaction pile to be able to apply that, that load. So uh, here's the, the, the setup in, in reality. This is one of what we call the medium-sized piles. They were about 800 millimeters diameter. And here's the reaction pile. And up here is the jack that is applying the load. And the, the system that we had was uh, the, the main group of tests that the, in plan. We had a reaction pile in the middle of a circle the circle of, of medium-sized piles around that reaction pile, and each was tested in turn um, against the, the reaction pile. And here you can see in, uh, in reality, here's the site of the reaction pile. The extension piece actually isn't in position at this stage. And here are the sites of the, the uh, medium-sized piles around it. And actually then, that same pattern was repeated at a smaller scale. Uh, to test some, some small piles, which were mainly used just for exploring uh, 
uh, some different options and uh, explore the testing methods. It was the medium-sized piles that were the main tests. And then at the end of the whole process, we had two large piles which we, we jacked against each other. Here they are here um, to get the, the response of uh, the largest piles in the, in the testing set, which were two meters diameter. And, and that involved some pretty large forces that applied to those two piles. Um, the two piles were identical. Uh, it was the one mistake I think we made in the, the testing program. We should have made them just slightly different lengths, and then we would have got information about two slightly different piles, but in fact we had identical piles. So here's some typical results. So. Uh, on the right hand side, here's the, the measured uh, response that we got from a field test. The blue curve is the prediction that was made by the um, team at, at, at uh, Imperial College doing the finite element analysis. Uh, and if you like, I can make some boasts on that behalf because I wasn't involved in, in that side of the work. And to be honest, if I was a finite element analysis uh, analyst, and I got that close as a prediction to a field test, I would be feeling really very, very happy. This worked extremely well for the clay. I have to admit the predictions for the sand weren't quite so good, uh, but um, the, the, the clay prediction is very good indeed. Uh, we're very interested in what happens right down at the bottom of, of the, the, the load path, the stiffness and the quite small loads, and Here's an expanded view just of this bottom part of the curve, and you can see that the prediction actually at the first part of the curve is extremely good. And if we compare with conventional, what is called PY analysis um, for, for these piles, that would be a red curve here, and you can see that this stiffness is indeed about a third of the stiffness that we measured. So this is confirming this result that was suspected from the behavior of the full size wind turbines, that the existing design methods were far too conservative. They were predicting too low a stiffness and uh, too low a capacity in the end. So that's the result on, on one pile, then um, uh, um, multiple piles, diff different lengths of pile, longer piles give, give a, a stiffer response. Again, you can see a good comparison with the predictions. And in the predictions, we also uh, had uh, the distribution of rotation down the depth of the pile and the bending moment in the pile. And the, the piles themselves were very heavily instrumented. And so we were able to compare the, the predicted, for instance, the measurements of the, the, the moment with the predicted moments. And you can see that they fit quite well. So we were very happy that the finite element analysis provided the good explanation of the observations that we had in the field. So at this stage, what, what we had was a, a method of analysis that we were confident that represented field conditions well. Um, and that included that the, the, the largest of the pile tests, this is the, the two meter diameter pile, you can see again the finite element analysis fits the behavior rather well. So in a little bit more detail, then what did we do next? So now we're confident that the finite element analysis represents ground conditions well. What we can do is use that finite element analysis to analyze a full size six or eight meter diameter monopile. And uh, from that analysis, we then extract the loads that are applied to the pile in terms of the, the lateral loads on the pile, that's the conventional components which are in PY analysis, but also in terms of some other components that uh, as well as a lateral load on the pile, you also get a distributed moment on the pile. And that comes from the fact that there are equal and opposite shear stresses on the, the sides of, of the pile. There are also components that you get down at the, at the tip of the pile. So from the, the finite element analysis, 
we extract each of the, these terms and uh, fit the response with simple um, analytical expressions that fit the, the curves that we get from the finite element analysis. And then we use those curves in a, a, a much simpler program, a one-dimensional analysis program rather than this complicated three-dimensional one, to try to reproduce the behavior of the, the pile. Let me just go into a little bit more detail on that, on, on how we do that. So at each level in, in the pile, having analyzed a, a large scale pile, you can uh, extract against the displacement at a particular point in the pile what the load is. Um, so you get that load displacement curve. Of course, they vary enormously down the pile a lot of that variation is because the local value of the strength of the soil is varying down the pile. So the first process is that you normalize these curves by dividing by the undrained strength at a particular level to get a set of normalized curves. We fit those just with some standard expressions. And here you can see the quality of the fit. So we look, for instance, at this red curve. The solid line is what was measured from the finite element analysis. The dotted line is just a simple curve fit to that. And the curves that are fitted, essentially a very simple curve that has a given initial stiffness, a given final strength at some particular displacement, and then uh, there's a parameter which controls how rapidly you go from the initial stiffness to the final value. So uh, in other words, how curved this section of the curve is. <coughs> So from this process, we, we then get each of these numbers uh, that represents these curves, and we can plot them with distance down the pile. That's from one analysis. We can then do that for many different piles, um, and plot those curves together, and we get a response something like this. So this, is, this comes from the analyses of many different piles using the three-dimensional FE analysis. And then we do a rather, take a rather bold assumption. We simply put a curve through this response, and we say that gives us a formula which gives us, uh, for instance, this ultimate strength as a function of depth. And each of the other numbers uh, in the, the, uh, the curve fitting procedure <coughs> have a simple relationship. And what we end up with is a table for each of these components of a simple formula which tells us how we can reconstruct that curve. Now, I apologize for the fact that this column is, is blank, and that's because at the moment we're still subject to some confidentiality requirements. So the details that are in this table are in a paper that has been um, submitted to Geotechnique in about a year's time that it will be public. At the moment, I'm not allowed to tell you the numbers. But in principle, the sort of thing that we have is that, for instance, one of the very important numbers is for this horizontal load, how do you estimate the initial stiffness? And the way we fit that is that the initial stiffness is just made as a, a simple linear function of the depth down the pile. We found that fitted with the ideal really quite well. And so each of these values is just a simple formula some of them are actually just constants, some are, are linear functions of depth, and actually only one of them is more complicated than linear. I'm sorry, I can't, I, you know, it would be nice if I could put the, the, the numbers there at the moment, but I, I can't get to that. So the idea is that you can then use this method in, in one of two ways. You could either just take the numbers that we, we uh, obtained from this program, uh, and use uh, essentially the table of, of parameters that, that we have already provided. And you can put that into your analysis and work out the, the response of the pile. And that's the way that you might start the design process in the early stages of design of a big project. Later on in a big project, you may well have much more sophisticated information about the ground, behavior, you may be prepared to spend a lot of money 
on, for instance, your own three-dimensional finite element analysis of the problem. And so what you could do is go through the same exercise that we did, which is that you could develop a, a model for the soil, you can carry out finite element analysis, and do the same process that we did of extracting the curves and then fitting uh, curves that would be the right curves for the soil at the site that you're interested in. So the, the design method that we're developing is not meant to be a completely rigid method that is sort of set in stone and you just have to use the numbers that we provide. The whole idea is more that it's a sort of um, a design approach, a design philosophy. That to start off with, you would use some standard numbers that uh, would be just in a table in a paper. But if you had some better numbers that you could derive for your own site, you could then use those. So how does this, this do, uh, if you like, uh, in terms of the quality of the, the results? Um, we use a measure of, of the, the, the quality of the, the, the fit to the, the real data. And here's uh, just an indication. On the left-hand side, each of these bars represents one of the tests that we carried out. This is at very small deflection of the pile. This is at larger deflection of the pile. And essentially, the, the blue bars show the quality of the the fit that we achieved using the design method. And if this achieved 100%, we would have, we'd be spot on. And of course, we're not quite spot on, um, uh, but we're reasonably close. The red bars are what uh, you would get if you used current design methods, the current standard methods that have been used for, uh, for previous uh, analyses. And you can see that the, the, the quality of the fit is down around about 40% um, for, the, for the large deflections and is even worse for predicting the stiffness of small deflections. So we feel we've, we've achieved a big improvement. Now, what you might deduce from this, uh, you know, if I was being brutal, you could say, well, current design methods are obviously hopeless. That is being very unfair on current design. These methods, if you like, the red bars, were mainly developed for very long, thin piles, typically with a diameter of maybe one meter or so, a length of 30 meters, very slender, flexible piles. We're then taking those design methods and trying to use them in a completely different application. Piles that are five or six times bigger than these were ever intended for but are also much shorter. So we're taking design methods that were developed for long, thin piles and applying them to very, very short, fat piles. And that's really rather unfair on that. The blue curves are coming from a, a research program that was very specifically directed towards understanding the behavior of these shorter piles. So, of course they do better. Uh, you know, it'd be pretty appalling if we didn't do that. Um, so then we can contest that on actually if we now uh, carry out a, a future design and, and here's just uh, concentrate on the right hand side if we if we use this one dimensional model uh, we can arrive at, at a point here uh, for the capacity of a pile at, at a deflection of 0.1 of its diameter uh, and you can see the capacity is much higher than we would get in conventional design. The other thing that you could do is say, well, suppose we wanted to use conventional design methods that would deliver a pile that has the same capacity as the new methods would give us. And what we find is that for this rather large problem, this is a, a diameter of nearly nine meters per pile, rather than a length to diameter ratio of four, we need a length to diameter ratio of 6.2. So in other words, rather than the pile being 35 meters long, it turns out it has to be 54 meters long, 19 meters longer. Now, on an 8.7 meter diameter pile, saving 19 meters on the length, you're saving a very big amount of speed. 
Um, and so this is a huge potential saving for the developers of, of these sites. And that actually um, made, the, made the BBC News. Uh, uh, about a year ago, the, the headline was that wind power is now cheaper than nuclear. And let me explain these figures. Um, the wholesale price of electricity in the UK is round about 50 pounds per megawatt hour. And that price is driven by essentially the price of gas. Because gas is the, using combined cycle gas turbines is the cheapest way to, to generate electricity. You can do that for about 50 pounds a megawatt hour. So that's the, the base cost of electricity in the UK. If you want to develop new technologies, you have to have some subsidy mechanism that persuades people to use something other than gas. And the way that's done in the UK is that there is um, an auction process happens uh, uh, every so often on technologies bidding in for subsidies that will give them a guaranteed price for that, the electricity for a certain period of time, usually 25 years. And the price that the nuclear industry is currently bidding in uh, for generating electricity is about 92 pounds per megawatt hour. So if you generate power, nu nuclear power, you get, if you like, 50 pounds is the, the wholesale price of the electricity, but you would also get 40 pounds of subsidy. And in 2015, wind power was coming in at around about 115 to 120 pounds per megawatt hour. In other words, there was about 70 pounds of subsidy uh, for every megawatt hour uh, that was being generated. And in 2017, uh, the, the wind industry was actually told when bidding for these subsidies, you had to get close to nuclear. We were told nothing more than about um, 95 pounds per megawatt hour. But the, the developers in this area are each bidding in with the keenest prices that they, they can uh, so that they actually win these problems. And it turned out in 2017, the wind developers were sufficiently confident of the reduction of cost that they came in bidding at 57 pounds per megawatt hour. So essentially in two years, the, the price had come down from around about 115 pounds to half of that. And more importantly, it means that the, the subsidy element has dropped from being about 60 pounds or so to being around about 10 pounds per megawatt hour. So it's been a huge development in this area. And this reduction in price is due to various advances in technology, but one of the significant advances is this reduction in cost of the, of the foundations, which is, is really quite a big contributor to that. This is also a fantastic driver for research because the companies that have now won these projects have now got to deliver them at that price. And so they, they're now saying, oh, crikey, yeah, we've said we can do that. <laughs> Uh, now, can, can you please, in universities, help us out and make sure we deliver? So it, it's good news for us as um, academics. So, uh, okay, so which directions are we, are we going in next? Um, th there's been a follow-on project on, on PISA, well, unimaginably called PISA 2. Um, and essentially, uh, what that be, that's been doing is been filling in the design method for some other, other conditions. So uh, the original uh, project dealt with the, the items that were in black. If you like, Pisa 2 added the items in red, looking at some different clays, looking at sands at different densities, and really rather importantly, looking at layered systems. Because in reality, you'd never find that soil is a nice uniform deposit. It's typically quite a complicated layering system, so first of all, we looked at simple sort of two-layer and three-layer systems, but also some quite complicated systems, uh, you know, supposedly realistic layer. And we looked at uh, different combinations of um, 
strong layers over weak layers, weak layers over strong layers, etc. And develop the design method for that sort of case. The other really important thing is, is cyclic testing. Now, cycling was not actually part of the original PISA program. But if you spend an awful lot of money doing some large-scale field tests, then you may as well uh, do as much as possible. And so we also did cyclic testing. This is uh, a, very much a, a speeded up, uh, I should say. Cycling was not at that frequency. Um, but you can get a little bit of an idea of the, the magnitude of the movements of the, the pile under the cyclic loading. Um, and what we observe is that at small displacements, notice I've, I've taken the numbers off the slides here, I'm allowed to show you the numbers. At small displacements, you get a very stiff response. Large, slightly larger displacements, you begin to see some hysteresis. And at bigger loads again, very importantly, you begin to see these ratcheting effects. At every cycle, you accumulate a little bit of displacement. And that's very important because Roughly speaking, the wind tends to come predominantly from one direction. And uh, if you get repeated cycling that's always in the same direction, and gradually this thing rotates around, that's not very good news. So we need to understand those effects. Um, so we've had quite a, an extensive program subjecting piles to, to different amplitudes of loading. And here's at the plot of the, the accumulation of that um, ratcheting effect uh, with many, many cycles, up, up to quite large numbers of cycles. This is from laboratory tests rather than field tests, but we're up to about um, 100,000 or more cycles in, in those tests. Um, and then we, we're doing work on, on modeling that ratcheting um, problem. So here you can see the results from, a, here's a test on the left-hand side where we apply a load and then is 10 cycles of loading, and uh, here's the modeling, theoretical modeling, of uh, this same test. And um, you can see that in the modeling approach, we're, we're actually managing to capture this uh, additional displacement that you get on repeated cycling. So a, a big part of our work now is, is trying to have a, a theoretical model for, for uh, this behavior as well. We're also, all the tests I've talked to about so far, the loading on the pile has just been in one direction. But of course, in reality, the loading is in multiple directions. So uh, here's a, a, a rig that we had in the lab, which allows us to apply loads in, in two directions to the pile, and then measure the deflection of the pile. And here's just a very curious test that we've done with the pile. It doesn't correspond to any realistic loading, but if you plot the load in the x direction and the load in the y direction, we, we have this spiral test where it's effectively sort of like stirring the pudding, bigger and bigger loads. It doesn't bear any resemblance to a realistic load, but it's a very, very severe test of whether you can model that with a, with a 